Stand by now for the 16th edition of See It Now with Edward R. Murrow, which originates in the control room of Studio 41 in New York City. Alcoa, Aluminum Company of America, in cooperation with CBS Television, presents the distinguished reporter and news analyst Edward R. Murrow in See It Now, a document for television based on the week's news and told through the actual voices and faces that made the news. Edited and produced by Mr. Murrow and Fred W. Friendly. A public service of Aluminum Company of America, the nation's leading producer of aluminum. Now speaking to you from the actual control room of Studio 41 is the editor of See It Now, Edward R. Murrow. Good afternoon. The NATO conference at Lisbon turned out rather better than many people had expected or feared. Agreement was reached on the divisions to be provided, on the money to be provided by the various nations. On Friday night, Secretary of State Atchison gave his report on the conference. We thought this afternoon you might like to care to hear some of the impressions of Mr. Atchison and also some of the impressions of the West Germans as well. And I have had a series of talks in London with the foreign ministers of Britain and France and with the Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany. Agreement was reached approving the creation of a European army by six nations, including Western Germany. We asked CBS correspondent Dick Hottelet to cover West Germany's reaction to the Lisbon meetings. Ed, this is the new parliament building in Bonn. Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, back from his meeting with Secretary Atchison in London, recorded his first statement for us in English. Let me make my country's policy clear. Germany is part of the Western community. Parliament has voted to join in European defense on the basis of full equality, which is the only foundation of mutual respect. We are ready to pay our share of the cost and to contribute our share of the troops as loyal members of the European Army. Across town, socialist opposition leader Erich Allenhauer takes violent exception to the government position. NATO is counting its German divisions much too far in advance. Before we rearm, we demand that enough Western forces be stationed in Germany to give security for our country against Russian attack. And we demand the equality and sovereignty which neither Lisbon nor London has given. Next stop, Cologne. The day the Lisbon conference ended, the people of Western Germany hung out the Do Not Disturb sign. They plunged into the brightest pre-Lent carnival since the 30s. Here, on the great cathedral square in Cologne, floats lampoon the European army. A little cardboard tank hangs out its washing on the Siegfried line. But, by and large, the keynote is a skate and laughs at the citizen wrung dry by the tax collector. The market value of military glory is very low in Germany today. Chancellor Adenauer is having a hard time persuading them that Germany has got to shoulder its share of the burden of Western defense. Young people are especially skeptical, and we asked Rector Werner Richter of Bonn University to tell us how the students feel. The majority of students is at this moment not in favor of rearmament. Their experiences in the last war have made them anti-militarist, but also bewildered. Mrs. Richter reflects the opinion of German women. German women are, like all women, in the first place mothers. They do not want to sacrifice their sons again and see their families destroyed. This is a German college dormitory, an old wartime air raid shelter. Maybe that's why the boys who live 50 feet underground feel this way about a European army. 
I spent five years in the army. After the war, we were, we were all defamed as militarists and war criminals. I don't want that to happen again. I was drafted in 1944, thought the Russians when I was 16. I'm fed up with all this military nonsense. I don't want a German army again, but we must have a European defense force. Look, I was a veteran when I was 16 and a half. I've had my fill. All I want is uh, finish college and lead a normal and peaceful life. Agreement was reached by which the return of West Germany to a place of equality and responsibility in the European community can be achieved. As of last week, four Republicans had been um, persuaded to become candidates for the presidential nomination, but only one Democrat, Senator Kefauver of Tennessee. But on Thursday, Senator Dick Russell, one of the most respected members of the Senate and chairman of the powerful Senate Armed Services Committee, announced that he would be a candidate. The senator is now sitting in our Washington studios. Are you there, Senator? Yes, Mr. Morrow. Good afternoon, sir. How are you this afternoon? Fine, thank you. Senator, uh, uh, why did you decide to become a candidate? Well, the timing was dictated somewhat by circumstances. I did not uh, intend to just make the decision so quickly, but there were some primaries coming up in some states in which I would uh, have to enter if I hope to have any substantial number of delegates at the convention. I, uh, without being immodest, think that I have qualifications and experience that might be helpful to the country in these strenuous times. Well, Senator, I don't think even your enemies would ever accuse you of being immodest, but uh, here's a question that a lot of people would like to hear the answer to, I'm sure. If President Truman decides to run, will you head a third party? Well, that question has been asked me a number of times, Mr. Murray. It seems to be in everyone's minds. I can only say that uh, I have never deviated from the support of the Democratic Party without knowing what the platform of the Chicago Convention will be. I could not commit myself unalterably to the support of the candidate and the platform because though I've never voted other than a Democratic ticket, I put my country above my party and if I thought that the platform was uh, da damaging to this country, I would not have stayed to leave the party, though I never have and have no plans for its future and hope that I am not compelled to. Well, Senator Russell, uh, do you plan to do any campaigning in the North? Well, I have responsibilities here that will not uh, permit me to leave Washington uh, very often. I hope that I shall be able to uh, present my candidacy to the people of the entire nation. I believe that uh, my views on some of these outstanding questions before the American people are of interest to all of the electorate. Well, uh, Senator Russell, um, one final question. Are you in this race to stay regardless of what uh, President Truman decides to do? Well, so far as the uh, Democratic Convention is concerned, there are no contingencies. I intend to carry through and have my name presented to the convention and hope that I will receive the support of the majority of my fellow Democrats who are delegates to that convention. Well, Senator Russell, uh, thank you very much for uh, chatting with us for a few moments this afternoon and perhaps uh, at some later time, you will permit us to bring cameras and microphones and uh, come visiting with you down in Georgia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Murrow. We always welcome you to Georgia. Thank I'm you, sir. I'm glad to appear on this program. Thank you, sir, very much indeed, Senator Dick Russell of Georgia. A few weeks ago, the Army announced that it had developed a lightweight, plastic, bulletproof vest. Last week, the Marine Corps announced that it, too, working independently, had developed a lightweight, plastic, bulletproof vest. This, of course, set off again charges of duplication, of waste, questions as to why one central purchasing agent cannot be developed. Representative Edward Hebert of Louisiana has been conducting in Washington what might be called a sort of peep show, where he uh, asserts that he can illustrate waste in the purchasing of the armed forces. Light bulbs, pillows, boots, that sort of thing. And the senator suggested that we might come and visit him in what he himself calls his uh, Chamber of Horrors. Ed, won't you come into the Chamber of Horrors with me and see for yourself what is causing so many sleepless nights and so many nightmares in the Pentagon. I'm sure the taxpayers would like to have you come in and examine for yourself and show them where there is so much waste in military buying today. Won't you come in with me now? Dark, isn't it? Come along with me here. I'll show you some of these exhibits that are on these boards and let you get an idea for yourself 
concerning the discrepancies in prices. Now, this is a, a board on which there are shoes and, and boots, Korean fighting boots. There's a differentiation in price between this boot, which is bought by the Marine Corps, and this boot, which is purchased by the Army. Now, it's the same boot, and there's a differentiation in price of something like seven or eight dollars. But let me demonstrate these shoes. Now, here are shoes. Here's one shoe that costs, in round figures, seven dollars for the Air Force. Here's a shoe, in round figures, six dollars for the Navy. Now, a shoe is a shoe. An airman is a man, an American fighter. A sailor is a man, an American fighter. Why should the sailor wear a different shoe than the airman wears? Why should there be any differentiation, uh, differentiation at all in the prices of that particular article? And remember that when you move one decimal point, you are dealing in millions rising into billions of dollars. And the taxpayer pays for it. And we get higher taxes because there's no judgment and no common sense in the purchase of these articles. Now let me take you over here to the pillars and show you another example. Now here's an army pillar at one price, a navy pillar at another price, a medical pillar at another price, and then the general services pillar for use among civilians at another price. Now why should four pillars be purchased for the same head to rest upon? Now we'll go over and try to throw a little bit more light on the situation with some of these light bulbs. Now, a light bulb is a light bulb. It gives out the light. It gives out the same amount of light. Yet there's a differentiation in price on these light bulbs between 7 and 14 cents. For the other side of the story, we went to the Pentagon and Assistant Secretary of the Army, Carl Ben Detson. Well, that was quite a display we just saw. It's been said a boot is a boot, and so it is. But these are mighty important to our troops and we have to buy large quantities at different times, at different places, and under different market conditions. And so with a light bulb. Well, you can say a light bulb is a light bulb, and so it is, but they're different. And if you go back some months from now and can get one at the same price as you got it last year, I would be surprised, and I hope you have that experience. Here's a pillow. Of course, it looks like any other pillow. But this is one for our hospital, where we have six soldiers. We don't want his bugs to be passed on to the next man, so we have it fixed as to prevent that. It costs more that way, to be sure. We're not throwing your money away. We're trying to buy what we need to buy at the best price. But there will always be differences when you buy differing quantities of the same item at different times. What's fair is fair. Let's look at the facts, not just the appearances. A light bulb is a light bulb, and an argument is an argument, as you have seen, and perhaps endless. Time now for Alcoa. Today they turn their cameras toward West Virginia. This line crew in the hills of West Virginia is making news. They are putting up the highest voltage electric transmission line ever built in America putting it up with the largest transmission cable ever supplied for overhead use, Alcoa cable. Designed to carry 330,000 volts, this 66-mile line of Alcoa's expanded ACSR, aluminum cable, steel reinforced, will link together two giant generating stations. Will mark for the American gas and electric system the beginning of a new mammoth network of electric power that eventually will sprawl over hundreds of miles and seven states. Alcoa has been making aluminum electrical conductors to carry electricity for nearly 60 years. ACSR for over 40 years. 20 years of research and development work with public utility engineers went into expanded ACSR before this line could be built. Today, more than half of all the high-voltage lines in the United States, over two million miles, are built with Alcoa cable. The expanded ACSR is the latest result of these years of experience. A cable large enough to handle the super voltages demanded today, to handle them safely and economically. Alcoa's expanded ACSR is light and strong. This means 
longer spans, fewer towers, less construction costs, an ability to withstand storm conditions, a high safety factor. A vital part of the highest voltage line ever built in America, Alcoa's expanded ACSR, is one more example of how Alcoa, since 1888, has continued to meet its responsibilities as the nation's first and leading producer of a vital metal, aluminum by Alcoa, Aluminum Company of America. We sent our microphones and camera crews out to West Kansas, the country around Dodge City. We have felt at times that both radio and television are rather superimposed upon this country, either from New York or from Hollywood. And we thought to stop off, more or less in the middle of the country, because in our opinion, the price of wheat and cattle in Kansas may be quite as important as the doings of diplomats. And it was for that reason that we sent our reporter, Ed Scott, and our cameraman, Marty Barnett, out to Dodge City, Kansas, to do a report for you. Ed, you are looking at a square yard of Kansas dirt. What looks to us like wild grass or weeds is actually winter wheat. This is Ford County, western Kansas, on the mid-meridian running right through the center of the United States. In 1952, western Kansas will produce more wheat than Argentina. On these short winter days, when the sun doesn't shine, it's difficult to know where the gray-white sky meets the gray-brown earth. In Kansas, you can't help looking at the sky, for somewhere off in the distance, it bends down to meet the rich, flat land. This is where a lot of our bread and meat come from. That's the Santa Fe Main Line, heading east through Dodge City. Once famous for Boot Hill, Kansas Bad Men, and the Trail Herd, up from Texas. Bank deposits in 1933, a little over one million dollars. Now, something better than 17 million. Average farm income in the southwest corner of Kansas, a little better than $18,000 in 1951. But folks in Kansas, still remember the long drought, the smothering dust, and the average annual wage of about $700. Dodge City, which means Western Kansas, has its historian. His name is Heine Schmidt. My first recollection of life is standing around my father's blacksmith shop, surrounded by the freight wagons and the covered wagons and the cow ponies. From 1871 until 1878, Dodge City was known as Buffalo City and was the largest market for buffalo hides and meat in the world. From 71 until 78, 5,860,000 hides were shipped out of Dodge City. But the Great Plains country was broken up and put into crop. Uh, there was a period of several years when the cattle industry almost passed out of existence. But uh, during the last 10 years, the cattle industry has come back to western Kansas until I firmly believe there are more cattle now on the farms and ranches of the great western plains than there ever were in the history. Last week, more than a million dollars worth of beef on the hoof was sold at auction at Dodge City. It will average almost that every week of the year. I know, but we call it, we it, man. Roll it around. Aren't our little boys I guess, aren't they? These feeders will be fattened on grain and corn before they go to market. The auction is big business and requires as much skill as bidding on the stock exchange, maybe more. Just as there is no such thing as an average GI or an average lawyer, there is no such thing as an average farmer. But the average sized farm of western Kansas is about 650 acres. This is River Valley Farm, owned by Herb Clutter. 
He has slightly more than a section, which means 640 acres. The Rural Electrification Administration has pretty well eliminated old stoves and iron pots. This is Herb Cutter's combine. It reaps, threshes, and pours a stream of golden wheat out the spout. Practically nothing is pulled by horses on a modern farm. It's all machinery. Fifteen or twenty thousand dollars worth of it. Herb Cutter explains. This is only a part of the machinery needed to operate an ordinary sized farm. And in order to make these farms economical, you certainly have to have a farm big enough in order to use this machi machinery efficiently and pay for the investment that you have. It runs into tremendous amount of dollars, and even for an average sized farm, we might consider a minimum of about $20,000 in machinery. The farmer is getting more for his crop. He's also paying more for his equipment and everything he buys. To make $20,000 worth of equipment pay off, you've got to have about 600 acres to farm. Paul Glenn, a veteran, has only 489 acres and can't get any more. My name is Paul Glenn and I'm from Dodge City, Kansas. I live on a farm which consists of 480 acres, which in this part of the country is considered small. It, out here in this part of the country, a fellow in my position, it would be hard to, to get any more land because around me it's all taken up and the only way I'd ha have acquiring land would be to buy it. And a fellow in my position, I'm sure, would not buy it. This is Roger Polkingham. One day he'll own more than 600 acres. He will bring to those acres four years of scientific training at the university. But even at the age of 13, he, he is busy with 4-H club activity. Well, uh, preferably a grain ration. Uh, uh, you don't want, you want to keep them growing uh, rapidly. As long as you got them on the rye pasture, a good pasture, you won't need to feed quite as heavy grain. But you want to keep them growing rapidly. Of course, you don't want them getting too fat either. Uh, how often should you oil these? Well, now, in uh, fitting, getting ready for the show, uh, oiling them uh, once a week would be sufficient. Try, that is, if you're going to wash them once a week, too, Roger. Uh, you want to uh, oil them with uh, mineral oil, or uh, even a brillantine is all right on the black. And then on the, on the white band, see on there, uh -huh. you want to take white talc and put on it. The women of Dodge City wear no more calico or gingham than women of any other prosperous community. I'm Mrs. Ed Harms from Dodge City, and we farm north of town. As a housewife, I'm kept quite busy with three youngsters going to school. One of them in the first grade goes to one school, and one in junior high goes to a, a different school, one in senior high, and they all go at a different time. I have a daughter working, and she also has a different time to go to work. And then we have one son in Korea, and of course that takes letter writing, packages, in Dodge City, as in almost every community between Omaha and Denver, the tallest building in town is the grain elevator. Holds enough wheat to supply every American home with a loaf of bread. The storing and shipping of wheat is a delicate and highly mechanized science. The farmer's trucks are unloaded here. We reckon there's enough wheat in that truck for about 10 million pancakes. A conveyor belt carries it to the top of this 140-foot elevator. This conveyor belt carries the wheat into the storage bin. Wheat in storage must be tended like wine. Left alone, it would ferment and rot. So five times a year, the wheat is turned over, removed from one bin and moved back to other storage units. This wheat will feed people in Boston and Bombay, Seattle and Singapore. It is virtually sprayed into railroad cars, which will carry it to every port in the United States. About 28 freight cars of wheat roll out of Dodge City each week. Some of the farmers who trade in Dodge City live as far away from the town as Boston is from New York. For some of the successful ones with big holdings, their plane is as useful as the Model T was 30 years ago. This plane belongs to Haskell McKinley, who has 10,000 acres north of Dodge City. Our reporter, Ed Scott, flew out to the ranch with him and reported that three Cadillacs rolled out across the field to meet them. Still another Cadillac, equipped with a special cattle calling apparatus, summoned the animals to be fed. Mr. McKinley's son 
held our microphone up to this cattle calling gadget for us. Mr. McKinley and his partner run about 3,000 head of cattle. Haskell McKinley knows that the years have been good to him, but he remembers another day and another kind of ranch. Well, Ed, uh, you know, back in the 30s, uh, this ranching business uh, wasn't so good then. And uh, we had a uh, struggle to make a living off of them. And then along came the dust storms. We had to uh, move into, Gar we moved into Garden City, Kansas. And, and uh, I traded in livestock there to uh, be able to make a living for my family. And uh, that's what I did then for, oh, say, 10 years. And uh, then uh, I went in with my brother, Ted McKinley, on the ranch here as a partner. And uh, we've, uh, uh, through hard work, and uh, I suppose you'd say maybe better times, and uh, then we'll give old Mother Nature a little uh, boost there too. We've had, uh, we've had good years. Farmers and sailors know better than most people that there are some things that you just can't do anything about. But in this corner of Kansas, they're determined that the Dust Bowl won't come back. Soil conservation, contour plowing and terracing, hard work and good sense, okay, price support, wars, a lot of things have combined to bring the farmers from southwest Kansas a long way up in the last 20 years. They're determined not to go back. For the next 20 seconds, we should like to look back 20 years. Some of this dust blew as far east as New York City and darkened the sky over it. The wind was recorded at the time. Everyone over the age of 20 in Kansas remembers those scenes, and they are determined that they shall not return. Perhaps in our visit to Dodge City and the surrounding country, we made it appear too simple. It isn't just a matter of putting seed in the ground and then waiting for it to grow. And it isn't just a matter of turning cattle loose and then finally selling them. There is always risk. There is always danger. You must know what it means to be as cold as people get in Kansas in the wintertime and how hot it gets in the summertime. And you must know what it means when a hailstorm comes along and beats down your wheat crop. As you have seen, everything's up to date in Dodge City, but they haven't decided that they've gone as far as they can go. Good afternoon and good luck. This is aluminum. Nature made it light. Alcoa made it plentiful and low in price. This is aluminum, the wherever egg poacher, that makes it so easy to cook delicious, appetizing poached eggs. Wherever, first in America's kitchens. This is aluminum, a better kind of Venetian blind for home and business. Its sturdy slats are feather light. They stay like new for years and years. Venetian blinds of Alcoa aluminum are easy to keep clean, never lose their luster, are available in natural finish or brilliant color. Another economical product of Alcoa aluminum, light, attractive, and long-lasting. There will be more and more Venetian blinds of Alcoa aluminum when our country's defense needs have been met. Aluminum from the ever-expanding facilities of America's foremost producer, Alcoa, Aluminum Company of America. This is the CBS Television Network.